And and what goes better with celebrating anything <laughs> than wine? We have some great Nova Scotia wineries, some great wineries in New Brunswick and PEI. There's, you know, in Ontario and Quebec, we've got some great Canadian wines. And, and I've been learning all about them since moving here. I'm no expert by any means. But the lady sitting in front of me is. Natalie McLean is here. And inter- can I, you're a sommelier. I am. And I an am. author. Yeah, exactly. And a, uh, and a journalist. And a drinker. <laughs> <laughs> Most importantly. Well, okay. Well, okay. You said that I didn't. Yes. I don't know that I would have introduced you that way. But <laughs> do you think that's, that's a pejorative term? Is it fair to say I'm a drinker? Absolutely. I mean, I enjoy wine. I mean, I, there's a reason why I'm not, you know talking about orange juice here this morning (laughs) but I think there's something about one that engages us on a number of different levels so you know there's the intellectual level if you want it It, I always say you could almost do a university degree with wine as the organizing hub so wine connects us to other cultures and science and agriculture and commerce and then there's a sensory level of how does this wine smell what uh, foods does it go with? How is it different from others? Mm-hmm. And then finally, there is the pure hedonistic buzz. I mean, wine has alcohol. And I think it's because it engages us on all of those levels that it's it, it's why there are so many people interested in learning about it and why consumption is on the uprise. Absolutely. And it's funny because the NSLC put out numbers, I don't know, I, I think it was after the summer, that showed that beer consumption actually dropped in Nova Scotia and wine went up. Right, exactly. Which, and you think Nova Scotia, especially Halifax, it's got it's like a beer drinking kind of place, but you know, truth be told, if I had to choose between you know, and I won't name a big brand of beer that's brewed right in our city and a Chardonnay, I'd probably pick the white wine. Exactly. And and that's what the studies are showing across the country. Um, numbers coming out from StatsCan and Gallup Poll show that wine is growing much faster than beer and is now the preferred alcoholic beverage, not by volume, but by um, when you ask the number of people who prefers wine versus beer. Um, and I think, you know, it's just wine to me is the drink of conversation. So it's not for knocking back, mm-hmm, <laughs> mm-hmm. maybe certain brands, but most of them you drink over dinner with friends. And it's just, uh, you know, it's it's really enjoyable. So let's talk about you for a little bit, because you have written two books, and both of the titles made me giggle out loud. The first one, Red, White, and Drunk All Over. Right. A Very serious. A wine-soaked <laughs> journey from grape to glass. And your most recent one that has, um, it's Unquenchable, a tipsy quest for the world's best bargain wines. Right. Exactly. So, you know, I think first and foremost, a book about wine has to entertain, and, mm-hmm. and thus the titles. Um, education is a distant second. Uh, it's great. It's a bonus. But I think if if you're not entertaining people and keeping them engaged, you've lost them. And so what I try to do with in both books was to seek out the most colorful, iconic, obsessive compulsive winemakers that I could find and in telling their story tell the story of wine and I think people want to read about people and it's much more interesting to to approach it that way so there are lots of adventures there's you know lots of quotes and things but uh, you know to keep the story moving along and did you, where did you research this? Did you travel around the world or did you focus on one specific region? I went around the world. It was a tipsy quest and I went to <laughs> eight, eight different regions. And what I was looking for in each region were those undiscovered gems of the wine world. So where your your price quality ratio really um, was amazing. So I wasn't on the search for the world's cheapest wines because mm-hmm. there are a lot of cheap and very uncheerful wines, but I was on the search for bargain wines. And so I think there's a, a price range of 10 to $20 where you can get wines that taste twice as expensive as they cost. And so with that in mind, I went to, um, let's see if I can remember them all, <laughs> Sicily, South Africa, or Argentina, Niagara, um, Portugal, Provence, Germany, and Australia. Wow. Yeah, it was fun. And so you get to do a bit of armchair travel as well. So people really enjoy that either, you know, if they're going to eventually go themselves and maybe it helps to plan a trip 
or if you never get there, at least you can go along on the journey with me. Absolutely. Or you can just go to your local liquor store <laughs> and, and, you know, cook a French meal and have a bottle of French wine. So, so where were some of the best, like you said, price to quality ratios that you found? All of those regions really, really did excel. I think you can, in the liquor store, you can look for any of those regions, any of those countries, and you will find terrific wines. Um, I started off with Australia because, you know, the, the wines there are still extremely popular these days. Um, you know, with the Shiraz and the Cabernet and the Chardonnays and so on. And, you know, I met the most wonderful winemakers, like Wolf Blass. He's not a brand character. He's actually, some people think of him like Duncan Hines. Yeah. <laughs> he's just a marketing thing. But he's not. He's a real person, a man with a lot of passion for his wine. He's into his 70s now. And he's uh, he's very colorful. He's a bit randy, too. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun meeting him. He, uh, he was describing his uh, red label sh- uh, Cabernet Shiraz. He goes, oh, I call this wine the leg opener. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. I would like that, too. Oh, <laughs> And uh, but you know he he it's all a wink and a nudge and he means it in great fun yeah but you know it's it's people like that that for me bring wine alive the the people and the stories behind the bottles so as I said the you know each chapter ha- has this sort of narrative but then at the end of the chapter I put insider tips so I do you know once you get to the end you think well how's this going to help me shop for wine so the very practical part comes at the end of each chapter where I list the wineries to look for in your liquor store food pairings recipes um, websites that you might want to go to to learn more about wine Speaking of that, on my own site at mm-hmm. nataliemcclain.com, I recommend terrific bargain wines every week that are available in the Nova Scotia Liquor Store and other liquor stores across the country. Um, but I also pair books. So, you know, in Australia, <laughs> I paired uh, Alice in Wonderland, you know, Down Under. And anyway, it's just for fun, but book clubs get a kick out of that because I've heard more than a few book clubs have a little wine when they gather. I have heard that. I've been looking for a book club just like that. So if you have one that's operating in the Halifax area, I'm on Twitter at Aaron Trafford. Ah, there you go. Yes, book and wine clubs. Exactly. How fun is that? I think some of these are really wine clubs disguised with a few books (laughs) lying on the table that never get picked up. (laughs) But it's a lot of fun. So let's let's talk about Nova Scotia because you're from here and there are some great wine. Well, I mean, as far as my unsophisticated palate goes, I have had a quite enjoyable experience drinking some of our local stuff. So let's talk about some of those. I'm not going to name any. I'm going to let you. Sure. I'm really excited about what's happening with the wine industry here in Nova Scotia and and Atlantic Canada. Uh, But specifically in this province, there are so many wineries that are producing terrific uh, wines. I'm especially a fan of the uh, crisp whites like Lacadie Blanc Mm -hmm. or Riesling. They're terrific with shellfish and seafood. um, But uh, there are also amazing um, bubbly sparkling wines like Benjamin Bridge Uh, and if you look at what they're doing on a quality level and compare it to champagne you're paying half or maybe a third of the price with a bottle like Benjamin Bridge um, you, you, which uh, he has uh, the, the winery produces a number of uh, different bubblies, but one is twenty five, another is is more premium at a higher price. But you compare that to champagne, you're going to start with sixty or seventy dollars for a bottle of champagne. So, you know, if you're thinking bargain wines for the holidays, for New Year's or your Christmas dinner, um, Nova Scotia is a great place to start. Other ones include uh, Yaus, that's a very popular wine here, terrific winery. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, a domain Grand Prix. They, mm-hmm. they do wonderful wines, and uh, you know, there's ice wines. We're terrific at that as well, and some ciders, and a lot of really uh, good bottles for for the holidays. And you know, twenty five bucks. That's a perfect thing to bring to a New Year's Eve party or something like that. I mean, that's kind of the right price range for a hostess gift, right? I, I think so, because we all splurge a bit more during the holidays. But it, what's better than a you know a local gift that has a story because you know you know maybe something about the winery or at least it's it's from here so what's the etiquette when it comes to bringing a bottle of wine Uh, there's been much debate about this in my house and in my circle of friends if i show up at your house and i bring a bottle of wine the expectation is that we don't have to open it right exactly exactly so when you bring a bottle um when i bring a bottle i leave it up to the host so um they may have all the wines planned for the evening to match the food. They may have them already open and decanting. So I just leave it and I expect that what I bring is a gift. Unless I call ahead and say, I have this amazing bottle that I just schlepped all the way back from Napa and I'd really like to share it with you on Saturday night. 
do you think this will go with what you're preparing? They could say yes or no. And um, then, you know, and if if we're going to share it that night, I'd bring another bottle that is truly a gift because you're going <laughs> to drink some of it. Um, but when I'm the host and someone brings me a bottle, I do try to open it. So unless, you know, it's going to be a total mismatch with the food, um, I think it's a nice gesture to, to open the wine. Okay. Well, that clears it up a little bit because okay. we've got we've been going back and forth on that in my house. No, you open it. No, you leave it sitting on the buffet or wherever. Um, we're going to take a quick break, but we'll talk more, okay? Sure. Natalie McLean is my guest in studio talking about wine. And you know what? If you have a question, you can call us up, 1-877-801-8255 or 405-6000. Brett just opened the line, so uh, we'll take your calls on that as well. I'm Erin Trafford. You're listening to Maritime Morning. <laughs> Ha, knew that was coming. Yeah. <laughs> Natalie McLean is my guest in studio. She's an author, a sommelier. She knows everything about wine, where to get the good stuff, what is the good stuff, how to identify the good stuff. And I can see Todd's on the line here, Natalie, but I have one question, actually, I want to ask you before we get to Todd. And I joked with producer Brett Ruskin at the start of the show about this. Why is it that when one... And when I say one, perhaps I mean myself, opens a bottle of wine with the intention of only having one glass. I'm just going to have one glass with dinner. Why do I drain the whole bottle? (laughs) Why does that happen? Because you're thorough. (laughs) Well, a a new word I discovered along my travels was senosilica phobia. And a winemaker sprung this word on me. And he said, have you ever uh, felt that? And I said, "Uh, no, I don't (laughs) think so. Maybe Maybe recently. Anyway, senosilicophobia means, seno means empty, as in senata from the Greek. Silica means glass, Roman. Fear of the empty glass. Huh. That's what you're suffering from, Erin. Am I? I yes. think it might be inherited. I hope my mother's listening. <laughs> okay. I feel like that's something that's definitely inherited. <laughs> so let's go to Todd in Halifax right now. It says he loves wine as well. Hi, Todd. Hey, how are you doing today? Very well. So what's your question? Well, you know what? I, I'm not sure that it's so much a question as it is a, a, a statement of fact. You know, Natalie, the, you seem to have, you know, a number of, uh, of titles that Aaron's been uh, kind enough to afford you this morning, sommelier. Um, but I will tell you, I, I think we need to add in motivational speaker as well. Oh. Uh, I'm on my way to the airport. I'm going to New Brunswick today to, uh, to uh, spend some time with a couple of friends. And I'll tell you, if I've ever been more motivated in my life to grab a couple of great bottles of red and sit down and share it with my buddies, you know, it's the truth. You're so right that wine is the the drink of conversation, and you know, I, I look forward to picking up your books now and maybe throwing them in the stockings of a couple of my friends because, um, you know, in my twenties, I must admit I, I was a beer guy, and you know, now in my uh, my mid forties. Um, you know, there are so many great undiscovered wines in Nova Scotia. And I would throw this out. I, I picked one up a, a little while ago. Um, and, I, and I haven't typically um, partaken in a lot of Nova Scotia wines. But you mentioned Yost. And they do a, um, a Prima Rosa. And it's about $10.50. And it's as good as any bottle of wine that I've had in my travels. And I've been in uh, 45 countries now. And you know what? You're right. Wine is is conversation. It's entertainment. It's, you know, it is. Absolutely, Todd. Thank you so much. And your complimentary bottle is in the mail. (laughs) Just kidding. I don't know, Todd, but I really like them now. I'm so glad, Todd, that, you know, I've done my job if I've made you thirsty. So um, I am going to find that Prima Rosa this weekend um, while I'm in town and uh, take a try of it because I'd love to to post a review on it of it on my website along with the other wines I've been reviewing lately. So if it helps, Todd, um, also check out the site at nataliemcclain.com because I'll have some more recommendations for you. Absolutely. And, you know, I had that wine recently and the guy in the, in the liquor store, you know what, that's, you know, I want to ask you about this because I go in there often and I'm thinking I want to get a gift wherever I'm going, you know, if I'm going to a wedding shower or I'm going to a dinner party and I say, okay, this is what I'm going to, or this is what I'm cooking. And they're great at recommending stuff too. Like those are untapped resources. I think that people kind of take for granted. They're not just stock boys. Like to work there, they know their stuff. Absolutely. And he recommended actually that Prima Rosa. We were having um, a nice pasta dinner with the garlic bread and the salad and just a really traditional Italian. And I was went straight to the Italy section. And he said, "No, try Nova Scotia." 
awesome. And it was great. Absolutely. And, you know, a lot of uh, people are afraid to ask uh, the folks who work in the liquor stores about wine. They, I don't know, fear of looking silly or whatever, but really they are passionate about what they do. Um, you know, I've never run into someone who didn't care. Um, and they just want to share that knowledge. And, you know, if you are a bit nervous, start with something like, you know, even something as general as, you know, do you like red or white or full or light or tell them your price range. Don't be shy because what they're there to do is help you discover something you're going to love. That's what they take pride in doing. And it's it's a great tip, Erin, to, to ask the staff. And similarly in a restaurant, you know, the, the server or the sommelier, usually someone is familiar with the wine list. Don't be afraid. You know, what would go with this meal? A simple question can get the conversation started. Let's talk about red versus white, because sometimes I tend to, and I don't think I'm alone in this, I tend to have a bit of an, a reaction when I drink red. You know, I get the the super flushed face right. and I, I know that that's not just me being anxious or whatever that there's something in reds that sometimes reacts with certain people so I've gravitated more to whites do you find that that is that okay like can I drink white with everything oh yeah sure you know the first <laughs> rule of pairing is uh, make sure it's a wine you like the best pairing is between you and the wine um, yeah with reds it, it can be the histamines and it can, or it can be the tannins people sometimes get headaches it is a good thing to chat with your doctor if you find it is a real issue but uh, that is why a lot of people like the whites and so you can even drink uh, drink white with hearty meat meals and so what you're doing um, in that case is trying trying to balance the flavors and textures and weight of what's in your glass with the wine with and what's on your plate. So let's say you have a steak. I would go for a really full-bodied white wine, like maybe an oaked Chardonnay from Chile or California, somewhere where it's ripened and the flavors are bold, because that's what I would do on the red side anyway, like with a Cabernet right. or something. So it, it's, it's definitely possible. And you should never be drinking something just because some critic told you to do that or that it's the perfect wine pairing, wine and food pairing. It really is about enjoyment. Richard's on the line. Hi, Richard. Hi there. Uh, I just wanted to say, Natalie, it's the first I've heard of you, and man, are you ever filling a need in the market. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here to help. Think you of me as your did. red-nosed superhero. <laughs> My life will never be the, cha- the same, you know. <laughs> Ever since the Kardashian breakup, I haven't been myself, but this uh, really that, helped. That must have been rough. <laughs> it was. I don't know how many bottles of wine I went through because of that. But <laughs> <laughs> oh, Richard. Oh, Richard. Yeah. I don't know you, but you've made my day. Yeah. <laughs> You're fun. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I actually, uh, I would stick to a $20 price tag because I had a hard time finding anything under $20. And I even elevated to 25 and it became a bit pricey, you know. Uh, you know, especially if you're, you're having company over, you need at least two bottles. Mm-hmm. Yes. Then you're at $50 just for, you know, and it, if there's a lot of company over, you're, you're that's not a lot of wine. It so is. it would be nice to have something. Uh, I, I'm definitely, I'm going to the liquor store today. Oh, good. Yeah. Excellent. Oh Great. My gosh. Glad Always you're on the radio. People. I'm so happy to hear this. I'll be listening all morning. Oh, thanks for the thanks, call, Richard. Richard. And good luck on your hunt for, for a nice bottle. And Richard, I just will suggest this. Yeah. That sure. Wolf Blast Shiraz Cabernet I was talking about earlier, uh, it's about $14 in the Nova Scotia Liquor Commission. Well, there I'll get 40 bottles today. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Richard. Thanks. Good luck. So interesting, Natalie, we're just tight on time, but I got to say we had two callers, both of whom were men, and that, that surprises me because I feel like wine is still a bit of a girly thing. Yeah, well, um, the the stats say that women buy 80% of the wine. Oh. We, we drink 66% of it. I call my glass at 5 p.m. Mommy's Little Helper. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think that uh, perhaps, um, I'm generalizing grossly here, but that women may not have as much confidence in wine Maybe that's why we might not hmm. be hearing questions today. But certainly, we are the the, the uh, leading buyers of wine and drinkers of it, frankly. But, you know, I welcome all thirsty people. Absolutely. <laughs> so, you know what? And on that note, there's an event tomorrow where people can go meet you, drink some wine, get your book. Exactly. It's a multi-course dinner uh, at the Atlantica Hotel starting at 6. Tickets are still available. Um, try ticketweb.ca or try calling the hotel. I'm not exactly sure at this point where the tickets are, but there is still room. And uh, it's like a four-course meal, all matched with wine. You get a signed copy of the book. 
and we're just going to have a lot of fun. Beautiful and great, perfect for stocking stuffers. Absolutely, you lovely know? holiday gift on its own or as a book and bottle gift set. Uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> you're now an advertising salesperson, a motivational speaker. What don't you do, Woo-hoo! Natalie McLean? Drink beer. <laughs> Well, thank you for coming in. I think just about everyone listening, myself included, uh, we're going to head to the local liquor store after this. So Excellent. I'll see you there, Erin. <laughs> Deal. Natalie McLean, you can find her uh, on online at nataliemcclain.com. We'll put a, a post on our Facebook page and our Twitter uh, account as well for you to, to access that more readily. Uh, written a couple of books. The, the most recent one, Unquenchable, A Tipsy Quest for the World's Best Bargain Wines. You can find it on Amazon.ca if you're online right now. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks, Erin. All right, we're going to take a quick break here for the news with John, and then we are going to get right into it with uh, about the 2014 Health Accord and where we want to see health care in this country go. Kyle Buett will be my guest.